Welcome all, thank you for joining us. My name is Maria Ferguson. I'm the curator here at the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute located in Jamestown, New York. I'm joined by Rachel Kaczynski, our assistant curator. And today we are delighted to be joined by artist Andrea Rich. Andrea's art is featured in our current exhibition, An Abundance of Riches, Woodcuts of Andrea Rich, which is organized by the Lee Yockey Woodson Art Museum in Wausau, Wisconsin. And it's on view here until April 14th. An Abundance of Riches explores the world of art and nature through Andrea's technically, technically complex and creatively elegant woodcuts. An internationally recognized artist, Andrea draws on print traditions as diverse as Albrecht Durer and a Japanese Yukioe, Yukioe prince to yield a body of work distinctly her own. During three decades of travel, Andrea has observed common and exotic species of birds and animals and experiences to depict. Her rich palette captures the simple beauty of landscapes and the humor and drama of nature. Today, Andrea will talk about finding inspiration in nature, including a demonstration of her woodcut printing process. For more information about Andrea, you can visit her website, which we will add to the chat. And if you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to type them into the chat. At the end of the talk, Rachel will read your questions to Andrea. And we are recording this talk, so if you'd like to watch again at a later date, you can head to our page on Vimeo, which we will add to the chat as well. So without further ado, please welcome Andrea Rich. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrea, and I'll start my presentation. I was born on Halloween in 1954. I'm from Wisconsin, which is home of the Woodson Art Museum and Birds and Art. I also would like to thank the museum for curating this show of my work and making it available to you. Art has been a constant in my life. I am the third of five siblings. My father used to tell this story from when I was about three. He had just finished cleaning all the windows in the house and had firmly told us not to touch them. Now here we were all lined up in front of the fogged window and dad with the cap drawn on the fog pane. Dad asked who drew it and we all said, wasn't me, wasn't me. So he let it drop, took us over to the table laid out paper and crayons and asked us to draw a tree, a house, a cat. Then he collected all the papers, walked us back to the window and held up the drawings one by one. I got busted. I got in trouble that time, but my parents were in general, very supportive of my artistic endeavors. My interest in creating art has never wavered. I was fascinated by the process of creating on a flat surface the magic code of marks and lines that represent the world around me. The ability to portray three-dimensional reality in a two-dimensional form has struck me as mystical. My passion was art, but my inspiration has always been wildlife. I grew up in rural Wisconsin, surrounded by farms and woodland. I enjoyed the company of a long string of pets, from cats, dogs, rabbits, turtles, and snakes to a horn toad that I caught on a camping trip in Arizona. The woods were full of chipmunk and squirrel, birds, possums, and skunks. We had a pet raccoon that my brother grabbed as it crossed the road one night, and a canary that I asked for instead of a Bible at my confirmation. In 1972, I started my formal art education. My degree is in art education, but I knew then that I wasn't really interested in teaching. My parents liked the idea of me as an art teacher with long summers off. Besides, my father said, there's nothing you can do with an art degree that you can't do with a degree in art education. I took classes in painting, sculpture, drawing, philosophy, history, creative writing, math, literature, astronomy, as well as classes in how to write a lesson plan. I did a semester teaching art in high school where I was barely older than the students. I received all A's in my art classes, though I couldn't really tell you why. Back then, pop art was big. Andy Warhol with his Brillo boxes and Jackson Pollock with his paint splatters. I remember being in painting classes, doing critiques, eager to learn why one painting was good and another worse or better. Imagine how confusing it was. In math, there's a clear right or wrong, but in art, there's no consensus of what should even be called art, 
much less what was good or bad. Apparently everything was equally relevant, making it all kind of irrelevant. But I took printmaking classes and that process especially appealed to me. I liked the physicality of it. There were no happy accidents. Instead, you had to have a clear idea of what it was you wanted. It had to be intentional. And it gave me something more concrete to work with. I was introduced to Japanese woodcuts and I was amazed with the range of effects and intricacies that they were able to create from a block of carved wood. I produced one woodcut in college, a black and white reduction block of a Komodo dragon. I graduated in 1975. By 1977, I had made my way to Santa Cruz in California. This is my husband, Don. I'm including Don because a lot of my story is of course his story too. We met in 1977, were married in 1978, and had a daughter in 1979. Don and I met at a yoga center. We've lived here in Santa Cruz for the past 47 years. After our daughter was born, Don, who's a physician, said, you can stay at home and raise the baby. And I thought, oh, that would mean I would have hours of free time to work on my art. Anyone with children will recognize the flaw in that thing. <laughs> it was a few more years before I could really devote myself to art full time. But when I realized I could make a career of my art, I began searching for sources that would give me inspiration. In the early 80s, I joined the local Native Animal Rescue. It provided me with close contact with many of our local species, from hummingbirds, the only bird that can fly in a shoebox, to hawks and owls. We had squirrel, fox, deer, raccoon, possums, and many more. I had an aviary at the time where we housed Edith, a non-releasable great horned owl, who I took to schools for talks. I cared for a young red fox, which had been caught in a leg trap. Now red fox are not native to California, so even though it had been born here, fish and game wouldn't let it be released. So while we were figuring out what to do, the fox was rehabbing in my empty aviary. One day, when I opened the door to feed him, he got behind me and escaped. I was really not looking forward to talking my next conversation with Fish and Game. But I had a dog, Meg, a white boxer, not known for any tracking abilities. But still, I put the leash on her. I led her to where the fox had escaped, and I told her to find him. She wandered aimlessly around the yard and ended up in the neighbor's cul-de-sac, where, lo and behold, I spotted the fox gone to ground in the neighbor's garage. Hallelujah. I knocked on their door and told them to close the door, went back and got a crate and recaptured him. Eventually, we found him arrived to Oregon where he was released. This is some of the artwork I did from that period. Quite a few black and whites and a few color prints. I have been to 22 countries and all 50 of the United States. I over, have over 35,000 images from my travel. Now, time here limits my ability to show them all to you, but I wanted to share some things that have stood out. In 1988, my neighbor who worked for USAID invited me to join him and his wife on a trip to Madagascar with a short stay in Kenya. While he worked, we women traveled. We were delighted to see lemurs but surprised to fall in love with chameleons and to find myself eating zebu brains with the president of Madagascar. I received an invitation in 1994 to join a group of artists to New Zealand, where we stayed on a barrier island, Tiri Tiri, a special place where all of the non-native species, every rat, every mouse, every cat had been eradicated. The whole process took 10 years. Then endangered native species were reintroduced. Takahes, saddlebacks, brown teals, silver eyes. The Takahe was thought to be extinct until 19, oh, now this is the wrong slide, but we'll find another one somewhere. I don't know what happened. Um, was thought to be extinct to 48 when a few individuals were found on a remote island. Here is the Takahe. 
So it was especially rare with fewer than 20 known to exist. But here they wandered into the kitchen while we ate our breakfast. This is a baby Takahe. And these are some of the prints I did from that trip. So now I was showing my work in museums and universities. And in 1997, I was accepted into Birds and Art, the flagship exhibition at the Woodson Museum. It was there that I met Denis Claval from France and Isbron Browers, oh, there's another Takahe, Isbron Browers from the Netherlands. Isbron had founded Artists for Nature Foundation and had asked Denis to recommend artists for a project in the Loire Valley in France. Denis invited me. The idea behind Artists for Nature was to gather groups of artists, send them into areas that need a preservation, and there they would produce art for local exhibits to illustrate books about the areas and to raise funds and public awareness. This first trip was a real challenge for me. The most of the European artists are well trained in field work and were mostly painters. So during the day, the artists were spread out over the landscape, sketched and painted and returned in the evenings back to the shared studio where a clothesline had been strung for everyone to hang their day's artwork on. Now my sketch, I took my sketchbook and wandered out as well, but I didn't see many birds and only domestic livestock. I struggled with my drawing, I kept hiking, hoping to find something that would be a catalyst. But at the end of the day, I returned to the studio to find the clothesline filled with lovely paintings of the area. I had nothing yet to add. But there was a Chinese artist, Zhu Yin, who had no sketches, but was painting. I asked him, how do you do it with no sketches? And he told me he just painted what he remembered and that nothing else was important. It gave me another way to think about it. I went back to my room. I did some simple black and white prints of what I had seen, the hay wagons, canals, pumpkin fields. By morning, I had three or four prints to add to the clothesline. When I returned, I created color prints to contribute. I participated in several projects with Artists for Nature over the next decade to France, Spain, Alaska, England, Israel, and India. Skip ahead, it's 2002. Don is working as emergency room physician. His schedule was flexible enough that we were able to travel for a month to Australia and Tasmania. I had decided on Australia because I'd seen a TV show on flying foxes and I really wanted to see them. And we did see them, huge colonies of them. I was even able to hold one at a rehab center, but I couldn't see the print in it. They're so dark and in the trees they roosted in the backgrounds were too dense and confused. So instead, I sculpted one. We loved Australia where every species was new to us. Even the names are fun there. Bilbies, echidnas, patamelons, platypus and roos. This, this sculpture next to my flying fox is an echidna. Now, some of you may have been to Australia, maybe you know the echidna. It's another marsupial, lays eggs, and it doesn't have any external ears. <laughs> I knew that when I sculpted it and ended up, they have big tufts of fur where the ears would be and mine uh, transmuted itself into an ear in the end. Here's the little echidna in the field. And these are some, they were already doing prescribed birds burns in Australia. So we would sometimes pull into a field that was scorched and burning and the trees were look, look like chimneys. It was a little hard to take. This is a cassowary. Grinding on an ab Aboriginal grinding stones. And that's Australia. But in 2006, we went to the Amazon basin in Ecuador. We stayed in a remote research station on the banks of the Tipitini River. It was many hours by plane, truck and boat to reach it. But what an adventure. We were coached that if we tripped, which is easy to do in the wet jungle, not to reach out to catch ourselves. 
The trunks of the trees were covered with two inch thorns. There were army ants that would swarm up your torso, torso if you got into their path. It rained every day. Under the canopy, you could hear the rain long before it fell through the trees to soak you. There were giant Bushmaster snakes, 10 feet long, that could lie in wait for months, waiting for their next meal to wander near. But the snakes that the researchers really were afraid of were the fur de lance. These snakes are smaller and thin like a twig. They're mostly green, and they lived in the trees where they're almost impossible to see. But their bite was deadly. There were also monkeys and macaws, caciques, and hotsons, fishing bats. We found a pygmy marmoset, which is the smallest primate in Ecuador. It spends its whole life in one tree. After the jungle, this is not also, okay, that was a print from there. After the jungle, we made our way to the cloud forest and enjoyed dozens of species of hummingbirds. Also, mannequins. Ketzels. And one morning, well before dawn, we drove across a very sketchy wooden bridge made of two old boards to hide in a tiny blind to catch a look at this bird, the cock of the rock. Now, it's not a great photo, but you know, five in the morning, <laughs> peeking through a hole, that's the best you can do. In, 19, in 2008, I found myself in the Hula Valley in Israel with Artists for Nature. This is an important area as it's the major stopping point in the migration path for many European birds, including cranes. Here again, I was up before dawn, hoping to see the cranes before they flew off to forage. It's a cold morning and the fog was heavy and laying on the ground. You could hear the birds pacing up and down the shore. But only a few were visible when they wandered close enough to be seen through the fog. This is a print I did from then. By the time the fog listed, however, all the birds were gone. Now it's 2009, and Don and I are visiting India. The ANF part of this trip was to a tiger reserve. As in Australia, many of the species are new to us. We watched monkeys, mongoose, jungle cats, elephants, and camels, but we never saw the tiger. We were close to one who was in a bamboo thicket, and when it roared, our whole bodies vibrated. But the, this print, oops, here's some more birds. There's those plum-headed parakeets that he likes. And this is the print I did from there, the plum-headed parakeets. It was the most beautiful sight. The parakeets flew down to pick these blossoms, which they flew back into the trees and gave to their mates. It was really lovely. Eastbron caught this snake climbing behind the bark on a tree. He brought it back to the studio to show everybody. The locals were horrified it turns out it's a crake, one of the most deadly snakes in India. He caught it with his bare hands. <laughs> in, 19, in 2010, I returned to Alaska to give a woodcut workshop. This is my third trip to Cordova, which sits on the coast, up the coast from Prince William Sound. Now there's no road into Cordova. You have to fly or take a ship or, and you have to make sure if you're flying so that there's no moose on the runway. Cordova's got 40 miles of road and it takes you out to two glaciers. In Alaska, the whole landscape seems to be supersized. One of the favorite pastimes there is to drive out to Power Creek and watch the grizzly bears fish for salmon. Got a few more from here. I've done quite a few prints from Alaska, hawk owls, ravens, and moose among them. Florida is another one of the states that I've frequented. I love the Everglades. One afternoon found us on this boardwalk watching a small pool drying out in the summer heat. It held one female alligator and her brood of young. 
The young ones were about six inches long and would hiss at the herons and the egrets fly that were fishing around the edges. There was one heron standing motionless for nearly a half an hour when suddenly it struck and was rewarded with a big fat catfish. But before it could follow the, swallow the fish, a barred owl dove from the tree and snatched it from his bill. Sometimes life just isn't fair. These are <laughs> some of the critters we see down in Florida. This is the manatee, which I was able to swim with. They look like they're big and fat like the seals around here, but in fact, they have almost no fat. Their whole body is filled with lungs, which is why they have to stay in warm water and congregate around outflows. Now I'm gonna, oh, and here's some of my art from Florida. Oh, now I'm skipping past Germany, Mexico, Budapest, and the Netherlands to 2018 and the North Pole. Who wouldn't want to see polar bears? We flew into Svalsvad and joined a small ship from Sweden. There was room for 12 passengers, only two of whom smoke, spoke English. Luckily for us, the crew was bilingual. This is my porthole in the room, our, in our, little room. There wasn't much sea ice left at the pole, which makes seeing the bears easier because they come down to the shore to scavenge anything they can find. We viewed them from zodiacs offshore. The bear can smell a dead seal from 10 miles away and they will attack people. So if you see one, you don't get out of the zodiac. The bears, polar bear's fur has no actual color but when you see them in the snow, they appear brilliant white. If they are on bear background, however, they look quite yellow. The bears are in trouble from global warming, but other species are expanding into the warm waters. We saw large colonies of walrus. We wondered why the walrus didn't just, why the polar bears didn't just eat them. But it turns out they're just too big. Their skin is too thick for the bears to get their jaws into. Walruses feed on up to 4,000 clams a day. They don't chew them, but instead have a specially adapted mouth that allows them to suck them out of their shells. They have no natural predators and are very bold. More than one tried to climb into the zodiac where they can sink them with a poke of their long tusks. The puffins too are moving north. As a rule, puffins nest in holes, but here we found a small number nesting on rock cliffs. We also saw reindeer, seal, arctic fox, giant colonies of myrrh, and these are prints that were inspired by that trip. Now it's 2019, and that found us in the Canadian Rockies. Now this trip is another bear bonanza, black bears and grizzlies, the bears are just out of hibernation, no berries yet to eat or fish to eat. So instead, the food of choice is dandelions. It's so unexpected to see these big bears grazing along the roadsides, munching on the flowers. This one nursing. We also saw big horn sheep, elk and marmots, mountain goats. And this beaver boardwalk, there's this giant beaver pond and there's a lovely wooden boardwalk all around it that the beavers will swim right up to. COVID kept us home. Oh, some bear art uh, kept us home, although in uh, 2021, but we did go birding down in Texas. We went looking for the migratory neotropical species that fly up from Mexico. And some armadillos. <laughs> and in 2023, we went up to Manitoba in Canada to find a bird that I've been wanting to see forever, the snowy owls. And that was a fun trip. And these are prints from that trip. 
then let's go on back to California where I've been enjoying our rich biodiversity for over 40 years. And I didn't even get any whale pictures in here, which I'm sorry about, but here are some of my slides, work I've done from here. Now I wanna bring you to my studio. It's a converted garage. It's about 800 square feet and it houses many collections of objects that I've acquired on my travels, as well as my tools and the printing press. I think of it as my own personal natural history museum. And if we're lucky, now I'm going to be able to show you uh, how I do a woodcut. And that this one. Okay. Now I have to find my, ah, uh, here it is. Can we add this? Let me try. Can you see this one? Yeah. Let me see if I can do this. <clears throat> okay. It's gone away. And I want to find it again. Okay, we got to pull it out of my office again. Uh, rich reduction. No, that's not going to do it. I got to pull it out of my. Oh, okay. What's this? Can you get out of this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, why? Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. This is there it. we go. Okay. So now what do I do? Now just click it open. No, no. See if it's in there. Okay, so on here. Um, I'm going to collapse it because it'll be on this close. Mm -hmm. There it is. There we go. Oh, right. Okay. Looks like she, well, I don't know. Is that on it? Can you see that? Can you see? Yes. Perfect. Oh, hey, okay. excellent. <laughs> 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 Technically challenged. I can do those wood cuts, but man, I'm closing. <laughs> I gotta play this. Here we go. Okay, now it's okay. not starting though. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It didn't start at the beginning. Uh, press, um, Escape okay, and here then go back go up to the beginning. To the there you go. Again. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> okay. I think that this one is already self timed. So, this is the print I'm going to show you. And it takes a minute, I guess, to go through. Okay. So, my original sketches I do on tracing paper. Since the image has to be reversed before it's transferred to the block since it will print in reverse. Once I have it drawn out, I flip it over and trace it onto the block just using carbon paper. You can see I haven't done any full color workups and all the detail drawing is part of my carving. For this print, I use the two blocks. This is the first one, which will have all the foreground and when I finished carving that first block, the background, all everything on it, I will ink it and transfer it to the second block. And do a reverse of it on the second block. 
So everything that's not on the first one is on the second one. And there they are. So we've got one that's the foreground and one that will be the background. A lot of times I'll use three blocks, depending on how many colors you're using and how they have to be divided up. So on this one, I'm gonna start with the background and I'm gonna print the lightest color first. So I mix it out, I mix it up, I roll it out, and I'll ink the ink wood block, and then I print it on my press. I use a pin method registration. I don't know if you can see on this, that there's two little pins there. The paper will go on the pins to hold them in place. And that way, every time I print it, it will be in exactly the same spot. So the registration won't shift. This is the first run of the background. So it has all just plain yellow. And then I will have to remove, I have to print all 30 of them because once I start the process, you can't go back and reprint. You have to only move forward. So I've done the whole edition, that first color. Now I carve away on that first block anywhere that I want that yellow color to show through, that first color. So you can see on the bottom edge here with the light color with the darker color over it, I'm adding that texture. So that I print all 30 of them that color. Then I go back again, re-ink where I wanted that medium gold to stay. getting a little darker, there's a little more detail, all 30 of them again. Some of the colors are pretty subtle, but uh, I like that about woodcut. It doesn't always have to look so hard edge. So now it's been carved again the fourth time and I'm inking it again with this now, I believe this is a bluer color, the sky, print light to dark so that the darker colors cover the lighter easier. And there it is. So that's all of the background finished for that print. And it's been printed four times. Now we're gonna start the foreground print. So here it is, the first color inked and ready to go. And I print that right over the, the last four. And again, that's just the lightest color in the foreground. I'm recarving that block. And you can see there's just a little bit more darker gray. Mm -hmm. Little details. Now I'm recarving that block again taking out anywhere I want that second color to, to show through. I've added a lot of little detail. And you can see it's starting to form up, the image starting to rise out of there. So now we're on the seventh run, still on the second block. Putting in the darkest, darker color, almost there. I think I've got two more to go. And you can see that the block has been reduced. There's not much left of it, which is why, of course, you can't go back. There's the darkest and there's one more. And there it is, a little bit of red. So I've got 10 layers on there on, on two blocks in addition of 30. 
That's all the stages. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you okay. so much, Andrea. Um, and so I would like, so and I know because this is such a fascinating process and you do have a description of it on your website. Um, may I share that in the chat? Just if anyone would like more Absolutely. information. Absolutely. Sure. Wonderful. Um, and, and one thing that, that I find really fascinating that you mentioned is, um, because you're carving the block multiple times, you can't go back, but also you can't make more prints other than the run that you make. So um, when, if you, if you make a run of 30 of one print, then, then that's it forever. <laughs> that's it forever. That's right. You lose it or you drop one or you, uh, you know, you rip one at the end. That's it. You can't go back. People would sometimes ask me, you know, well, could you do it in another color for me? You know, could you do it with a different background? I think, no, no, I can't do it. It's always about the next print. Always. So but I know we're lucky because you know a painter only has one painting, and uh, um, I've got at least got thirty all originals that I can uh, show in different places at the same time. There you go. Um, so while we and, and thank you first of all, thank you to to Andrea for joining us today. Um, so while everyone takes a moment to add their questions to the chat, I'll remind you that you have until April 14th to see Andrea's woodcuts in person here at RTPI. Um, and also just a little plug for our upcoming exhibitions, programs, and events, including the Banff Center Mountain Film Festival World Tour, which will be here in Jamestown April 19th and 20th. And you can go to our website to, to check that out and to get your tickets for it. And also to see everything that we have going on, you can head over to our website, rtpi.org. Um, so I will turn it over to Rachel to, um, to handle the questions. Great. All right, can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. All right, so there were a couple questions in the chat. Um, one that was from earlier is that, are there certain landscapes that are more appealing to you artistically like is there a certain landscape that you see and you automatically think oh that would make a really good print or there are, there are some that that you know right away will make a good print um woodcut is especially good at texture um at uh pattern you know color um it's very hard to get very subtle shading you can do it it takes it's hard it takes a long time um so some things, very subtle prints are, or very subtle landscapes are sometimes, I know they're not gonna, they're, they're gonna lose so much, you know, being, uh, being uh, converted to a woodcut that I, I like them better as a photograph. Um, but uh, some things have very clear patterns and, you know, and uh, yeah, some, some speak to me and some don't. <laughs> I guess is what I'm trying to say, yeah. Gotcha. Um, there is a question from Beth McGuire that asks what the average cost is for printing and then how do you set the price by size, by number of hours or number of colors? I use a French grid system to price my work. So it is by size. Um, I don't count the hours. It takes me about a month to do a print from start to finish, but then I have, you know, whatever the edition was, 30 or um, these days I'm doing shorter editions. As I get older, I do 20. Um, uh, but, oh, I'm sorry, now I've lost my place. So that's how I price them. Hmm. What was the other question? Um, what was the other part of that question? It, it, with you, it has to do with size. Yeah, I'm using it by size. Yeah, you can't really count your your labor. It, uh, you know, artists, uh, you 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 work until it's done. <laughs> you can't get paid by the hour. <laughs> um, we have another one by Carolyn Thomas that asks you to please describe how um, the paper stays in place with the little pins. Yeah. Um, and she asks, oop, <laughs> and it says, 
um, asking about how it doesn't tear or loosen or move around while you're working. Right. Um, I use the pins to do the registration. So you put the paper on the pins. I slide the block into that right angle on my press, and then I lay the paper down. Then I pick it up off of the pins before I put it in through the press. And the surface tension of the ink is enough to hold the paper in place. I'm using Oriental uh, Japanese papers. Some of them are quite thin, but they're they're tough. I use Kozo and Hosho. Uh, they're not as stiff as an etching paper, uh, like the Reeves. Those would slide around on the top, um, would be more difficult to use. But uh, those Japanese papers, that surface, the ink surface tension will hold it in place. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's another one from Carolyn that talks about your print raccoon on granite, which is hanging here at RTPI. Um, mm -hmm. She says it almost looks like a photograph from a distance. Was there anything particularly different that you did with this print than, say, the sea otters, which could not be mistaken for a photograph? So I think she's mentioning like it's, it's very, lot. very detailed. Yeah, like we said, there's a, you know, uh, woodcut is good at texture and those granite rocks had a lot of texture. Um, the ocean with the sea otters, not as much, you know, it's a more abstract kind of feel. So um, that was up on Salt Spring Island in British Columbia, that raccoon. He came right down the rocks to where I was sitting uh, and grabbed some, uh, one of my pencils uh, before, uh, you know, I backed off as he was coming down. I didn't want to disturb him. And, uh, but yeah, so I got a really good look at him. <laughs> but yeah, it was more about, it's more about, you know, just the texture. I'm better with, with woods and rocks than I am with water. I'm still struggling with water. Things that are more fluid and have less hard edge um, are a little harder to work with. I hope that answered it. <laughs> I think so. Um, for another specific work question, this one was actually for me. So oh. we actually have um, the lion tamarins downstairs, which yes. is 1988 work. And is that based off of like some tamarins you saw in real life or like a photo? Um, they're just very expressive and... Yeah, no, I only work off of my own photographs and uh, my and I never do anything I haven't actually seen, but I did not see them in the jungle. I saw them at Disney World in Florida and uh, they had a little island in the middle of the pond and we were down there with our daughter and had taken the boat out to the island. I came around a corner and they were in a little aviary um, I was just I was just blown away by them. I'd never seen one before. I hadn't heard of them before. And they were so beautiful with that long flowing red hair and the face the size of a quarter. Um, I had to do a print. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. so, yeah, those I really enjoy looking at those. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think the final question in the chat here is just that are there certain animals that are easier to make woodcuts of than others? Like for example, there's um, some crows downstairs where you carved out the very fine details in their wings. And is, is that usually very difficult to do or is that not really a problem for you? Yeah, it's not so much of a problem. Um, you see, I've done, a, I've been doing a lot of birds, partly because of birds and art at Wausau, but also because, um, they have so much color and pattern and they can be placed so many places in the landscape. Whereas if you do a buffalo, it's all brown and it's a square for no matter which way you look at and harder to move around. So I, it's not hard to do a bird. You still have to decide you, when you see them in the wild, you're not seeing all that detail. Uh, generally, you're seeing a much, you know, you're seeing uh, just the color and uh, shapes more than more than that really heavy pattern. Um, but sometimes you see a bird up close and you do see it and it's and it's makes it part of the part of the print. Yeah. Yeah. So not 
not that it's so hard. You just have to decide which way you're going with it. Are you going right. super detailed or more abstract? Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then we do have a new question um, from Ermin King that asks, do you see woodcuts as a visual art form that lends particular power to narration slash storytelling? Um, have you ever been asked to illustrate a storybook or books about birds or animals in addition to those you showed that were specifically for the purpose of animal slash nature awareness raising with your woodcuts, for example. And I can reread that because um, that was a lot also. <laughs> I did do a children's book back uh, in the early days uh, from that yoga center where Don and I met. Uh, the uh, guru up there uh, did a small children's book on a sparrow and a, and a cat. And I did a book of that. Um, and I have done, uh, used my uh, prints as illustrations um, for uh, uh, newspaper or for magazine articles about endangered species. The problem for me with doing a lot of illustration for a book is the time it takes to do a print. So if it's taken me, uh, you know, a month to do a print, a book usually has I think 32 uh, illustrations, a children's book. Um, and that's, that's of course, that would be years of my uh, years working to do that. If I was doing these full color reduction blocks, I could, I have done some um, chapter heads in black and white for books. And, uh, you know, there are ways to do it uh, less intensively, but this process that I'm using it makes it too uh, too. It's too intense to do a full book of just just uh, those as illustration. You could take all the prints I've done and put them in a book, but it wouldn't be the story. You know, to to tell that story, you'd need to have specific prints. So I've not done many children's books. I took a class in it once. I thought maybe that would be a way to go, but uh, but no, didn't work out for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Carolyn asks uh, if you could please talk a little about your carving tools, uh, what you started with, what you use now, and then how many different blades or tips it takes to do some of the blocks. I uh, use um, hand tools. They're all hand tools, uh, hand gouges. I get mine from McLean's Printmaking Supply in uh, Portland up in Oregon. I think it's, or is it Seattle? Oregon. McLean's printmaking supply, you could look it up. Um, they use, uh, they have Japanese tools. Um, they're all handheld. They're about, you know, four or five inches long. The widest blade I have is maybe half an inch. And they go down to micro blades that are, you know, and knives, which are very thin, um, you know, less than an eighth of an inch uh, wide. Most of the prints I do, I do a lot of that little micro carving. Um, I would probably use a half dozen different tools on a print, you know, from the widest to the smallest. Uh, I have U gouges and V gouges and knives, and it just depends on the texture you're making, whether it's got a sharp edge or a more shallow edge. Um, um, but usually on, on one print, I'll, I'll be using, you know, four or five different tools. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, uh, Carolyn also mentioned, we have a section of your black and white, uh, prints uh, at RTPI. Oh, no. And she asks if there was a particular reason you decided to leave color out of those and strictly do black and white. Um, yeah, sometimes, um, well, for just the reason we were talking about there, if somebody wants a, a, a small illustration for a chapter head or something, um, the black and whites are very, I find, uh, can be a really powerful print. Uh, they're very clean. They're very sharp. I uh, Those ones I uh, showed you, the black and whites uh, from the early 80s, they used as t-shirt designs. Um, uh, for the for the animal rescue here, uh, so sometimes I just don't want to do the whole the whole month. Sometimes I 
just uh, I just want to do a smaller pattern, uh, and it's more about then more about the shape of the of the animal. I think, yeah. Um, just because we're talking about those, we um, one of the black and white ones we have here is the dove key. That's just all by itself. Um, and I wondered, is there a little background story on that one? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, it's not coming up for me. A dove key. It's, I think it's a young one. It's very like circular and it's just kind of sitting by itself. And I can see a our website has a photo of it. One second. Oh, but that, I don't remember. Dove. here it might take too long for me to find it so i might just <laughs> withdraw <Yeah>. that question <laughs> yeah I, i'm not sure which one it would be um it's just some little bird sitting by itself yeah it's like a young one hmm. no I'm, I'm not uh too many of them <laughs> there are too many of them <laughs> that's completely fair <laughs> yeah all right, well, um, whatever it is, it's got to have a story. <laughs> I saw it somewhere. <laughs> yeah. We'll send oh, a follow-up email. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have one more question if we have time from Carolyn. Sure. Um, and it just says, what do you recommend as the best carving material for beginners? Ah, when I started out, I was using blocks of solid cherry, so inch thick Bores of cherry that I would have to laminate, plane down, sand down, and then carve. And you're only carving the very surface of it. So I was wasting all the rest of that cherry. And uh, it was very time consuming to do the blocks that way. So I found that they were making cherry plywood and I started carving that. Now, you know, again, uh, 30, 40 years ago, when they did a cherry plywood, the cherry on top was, you know, a good eighth of an inch thick. So it was, you could carve into it and it would, it worked very well for quite a long time. But then um, they got better, the machines got better, they could cut a thinner veneer until it was just a piece of paper. Uh, the thickness of paper was the cherry glued to some press board or something. So I couldn't use that any longer. Um, you can use, you can carve on birch wood. Uh, you're looking, what you're looking for is uh, wood that has an even grain in both directions so that when you cut across the grain, it doesn't all just chip away. Pine is too soft for that. Although if you're making a solid block, you could sand it and use the wood grain uh, as part of the print. These days I use a uh, lawn plywood. It's made from a basswood I think it's a basswood it's uh also a, a plywood but it's a uh, basswood all the way through there's no press board or anything the fact that it's uh, a plywood helps because then it doesn't warp uh, whereas a solid board will warp and be unprintable after some time um, so I use lawn plywood that I also get from McLean's they make it especially for printmakers a lot of printmakers I know are using the same methods that I'm using, but on linoleum block, and uh, which is much easier to carve. It dulls your tools quicker, but it's easier to carve because there is no grain. I don't find it aesthetically as pleasing for me. Um, I like to use the wood, but you know, I'm getting older now and I have arthritis and you know, I may have to switch to a uh, linoleum at some point, but I'm still carving on wood. But I would recommend the Luan plywood. Um, you can you can experiment with birch wood or basswood or, um, you know, go ahead and experiment. Maple is too hard, oak is too hard. Um, uh, but, you know, pine you can carve on, but you won't be able to get that fine detail on it. Um, you can play around a little. Do your own experimenting. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank and you I so much, Andrea. Okay.
Um, thank, thank you. Thank you to everyone for your questions and for spending time with us today. And um, we hope to see you all in Jamestown and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.